Okay, let's start. So, uh, if you haven't seen, I kind of posted the first homework. So, uh, and it's a link to a Google Doc, which as I realize issues, I'm going to edit it and let you know on Piazza. So, just keep an eye on that. Um, the submission um, is via great scope. Um, if, uh, yeah, I guess in previous years, we have been using great scope unofficially. This is the first quarter where UCLA has a uh, kind of official tie in with great scope. So, what I've realized is that it insisted that I have a different great scope account than what I was normally using. You may face the same issue. So, if uh, so, just check out, I mean, it might be under your standard UCLA, uh, uh, whatever uh, your UCLA login ID is. So, you may have to try, but all of you are enrolled in the class on great scope. So, the submission is through that. Uh, you should submit a nice PDF. What I mean by that is I'm not going to grade poorly handwritten stuff and all. I really, really, really would appreciate if you just uh, sort of maybe perhaps just make a copy of the Google Doc and write your answers uh, below that. That's probably the simplest. Um, uh, but at the very least, uh, when you upload to Great Scope, uh, what if you haven't used it before, it asks you to identify on the PDF file uh, the pages corresponding to each question. So, make sure to do that step so that uh, when I grade, I uh, would see that. So, that's important. The other thing is, it's possible that for uh, some, I think, uh, one or two parts of question number three, I think, uh, you can certainly approach it analytically, but you could also kind of, I think, I think it's just one part, you could also kind of just write a program and kind of or a script to do it. If you choose to do it that way, then make sure to submit the code also. And for that, I'm going to put a Dropbox link where you can upload the code. So, uh, that I will, I have to set it up, but uh, I'll do it in the coming days. So, so that's the thing. Second uh, announcement, so on Monday, uh, um, I'm not here, but we actually have a pretty interesting um, uh, talk by my student Sandeep on reinforcement learning. How many of you have heard of reinforcement learning? Some, a uh, lot of you. Okay, have you encountered it in any courses? No one, yeah, yeah kind of, okay. <laughs> so, reinforcement learning basically uh, has to do with uh, systems that uh, make, uh, they have to make a sequence of decisions and they are sensing the state of their environment through sensors and then they, uh, and the decision basically kind of you can think of it as and then they are giving a command to an actuator of some form, right? They are taking actions which influence the state of the world. So, traditionally we call it control theory. Uh, so, reinforcement learning is uh, kind of obviously very closely related to that. The main thing is that in normal control theory we kind of start, we kind of either use PID control or things like that where we kind of just react to errors, uh, but then there are also uh, systems where we assume we know a model of the world and then we design a optimum controller of some form for it. Reinforcement learning as the name implies kind of seeks to learn. So, the idea is that um, as you are doing actions on the world, uh, you are also kind of getting some uh, feedback basically and then you modify uh, your policy in accordance with that. So, uh, it is a old concept starting from 90s, but in recent years, particularly the marriage of reinforcement learning and deep neural network has led to some pretty amazing capabilities and like autonomous vehicles and all use it, but a lot of other places the idea is being used. So, in any case, Sandeep is working in that space, so he's going to give a lecture plus uh, kind of show you how you can in practice use it. So, um, there is this company called OpenAI and they have this piece of software called OpenAI Gym. Um, Maybe some of you have used it. Uh, I know at least one student is using it in the, in the course project. Um, uh, but you can play around, uh, play around within that with some of these concepts. So think of it like the modern, um, a particular kind of modern take on controls in any context. And uh, reinforcement learning is also what is being used by DeepMind and companies like these for game playing. So that's the other success story that they have. So, anyway, so that is the second uh, thing I wanted to mention. Uh, okay. So, uh, back to our 
lecture. Uh, so, last time around we uh, I was talking about uh, kind of the imperfections in clocks which help a computing system keep time and uh, there were sort of two main issues that we have to uh, deal with. One is the fact that clocks drift because the frequency that the oscillating element in the clock has is imperfect and that imperfection is partly a manufacturing issue that is you get something and the manufacturing tolerances give you an offset in the frequency uh, is partly an aging issue that is over time things change and partly a short term environmental issue which is uh, temperature fluctuates and things like that okay uh, which, 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 which uh, uh, cause issues. Long story short then what we see is that if you start uh, with a bunch of uh, uh, clocks then over time and then you sort of remove that manufacturing elements and you kind of assume that they all kind of start at the same point then over time they are uh, going to drift apart as well. The second issue is the offset in time. So, it is very hard to take two clocks and then uh, which are reporting different times. So, that is the reading of the counters and then say I want to set one counter exactly to what the other one is at that point in time. And that is hard because any messaging that you use back and forth will incur its own delay. It is kind of like you ask me what time is it on your watch money I say something and then you set it accordingly all that process by the time you set it it is going to be slightly different right. So, then, then, then what I so there is a whole bunch of communication delays that creep in. So, there is a software analog of that as you might imagine when messages are exchanged between two computers where one is seeking to transfer time to the other you run into problems. Uh, so, back to kind of so there is an oscillating element and then there is this whole paraphernalia around it the counter and the protocols around that. So, the oscillating element over time this was the last slide I had covered last time there has been um, the whole bunch of choices available to you and kind of our normal electronics tend to be in this top left corner quartz oscillators and TCX. So, your, if you open your phone they are probably uh, let us say around um, half a dozen to a dozen different uh, clock oscillators uh, in the phone for a variety of different purposes including uh, uh, like the GPS which needs much more precise clocks uh, or radios they kind of often have TCXO whereas your CPU may be just running on a standard oscillator because it does not need uh, to worry too much about that level of precision. OCXO <coughs> and chip scale atomic clock and full blown atomic clocks are really things you will find in more uh, fancier equipment like uh, missile in, uh, ICBMs or satellites or uh, cellular base stations and those those kind of things and also a sort of a lot of military equipment or kind of things end up using it would be pretty rare for, uh, to find in kind of ordinary devices uh, that a need for that level of accuracy. But again bear in mind that this is really talking about drift. <laughs> right. Uh, the error in frequency because of manufacturing that you can calibrate away that is relatively straightforward uh, and likewise the error in time you can calibrate away relatively straightforward again there is always residual error uh, in those things. Getting a good frequency source which is stable over time is kind of a hard physics problem in some senses. <laughs> So, uh, uh, so there have been um, a whole, like I, I think uh, uh, the hunt for better and better sort of uh, 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 sources of um, I guess oscillation if you may has always been around and uh, uh, lots and lots of uh, lots and lots of benefits from stable frequency and lots and lots of benefits from being able to measure time intervals very precisely. Uh, so, kind of whole bunch of uh, progress over that. Okay. Um, how do we characterize this drift over time? Uh, which as we can see is one of one of the key issue right because if I am trying to synchronize a bunch of sensors it is not simply saying at some point in time we synchronize their clock their counters because the clocks will keep drifting subsequently. So, we need to uh, do that synchronization of time repeatedly, but if we simply were to do it 
very frequently, repeatedly, I can get away with it, but then there will be a lot of traffic being generated. So what normally we also want to do is we want, uh, want to use a more stable clock or a clock whose model we learned and then uh, we uh, essentially these are simple uh, statistical models which you use to then learn the drift of the clock and then write on top of that model. Okay, So in fact the latest work in the spaces in, in this field have started to use machine learning type methods as well. So, uh, yeah, so uh, as I shown in one of the earlier slides, there are um, uh, this kind of drift happens at multiple time scales. Okay, this kind of uh, short uh, time scale kind of drifts and long time scales kind of drift, and you can think in terms of the frequency components which are happening. A very common way of characterizing these things. So, if you look at the data sheet, is something called <coughs> Allen variance, and kind of the basic idea is the following that we uh, uh, we think of you think of it like a variance over a particular time scale so the time scale that we characterize as tau and what we are doing out here is that we are going to uh, uh, calculate uh, so uh, so so let's imagine i have uh, uh, Kind of a uh, stable source, so something which is notionally giving me, let's say, a tick every one second, and then I have my clock, and then every time I get that stable tick, I am taking the reading from my clock, right? So uh, again, some stable thing which I believe to be my reference. Every time the tick <coughs> comes, I take a reading, and that's what we are calling as the y. So essentially, if my clock was perfect, then going from yn to yn plus 1 and going from yn plus 1 to yn plus 2, the deltas would always be the same, right? Because my clock is going to be aligned with that reference. So in that particular case, uh, uh, um, uh, in, 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 in that particular case, uh, uh, sorry, uh, forget. That's not y. Think of it as x. So those readings, the deltas would be the same. Except the question is, what <coughs> time, what period am I taking that delta over? So if I'm taking that measurement over very small time scale, then I'm going to be capturing short-term drifts. And if I'm taking it over a very long time scale, I'll be capturing very long-term time drift. So the yn <coughs> corresponds to uh, uh, the the difference over a particular time window that I'm looking. At. And then I'm going to take a variance in it. So essentially, I'm taking a variance over the jumps that my clock is seeing from one tick to another tick, where I'm looking at a window of certain time. So let me give you a numerical example. So let's say uh, this was my reference clock. So it was basically giving me every second, and this is by this is a standard, and then. Uh, my clock uh, is showing these particular counts. So if it was a perfect clock, then the jump here is going to be exactly the same every time. So I calculate these deltas. So this is what my y is, so y1, y2, y3, and I'm basically measuring the variance for that. And the tau in this case is the gap that I'm worried about out here. So I can define my variance uh, over different values of tau, like for example, I could, in this case, I'm doing it for tau equal to one, but I could have done for let's say tau equal to two and tau equal to four or different other values. So this is a variance defined over a particular time horizon. And so you can have clocks which are very good in terms of long-term stability, but they are very, but they meander around at short time scales a lot. And then it could be the other way around. You could have clocks which are which look very good uh, at short time scale. They are particularly stable when you are examining small time intervals, but they gradually drift over. Uh, if I were to look at, let's say, uh, what's happening to them over a, an hour or a day or a week, then they might be drifting quite a bit as well. So uh, we can uh, we can define uh, Allen variance 
over different time horizons. So its parameter is according to this tau, and therefore depends on the time period that uh, we are using. A low Allen variance intuitively therefore corresponds to a good clock over the time horizon that we are of interest. So ideally, we would like to have a clock which has low Allen variance at all time scales, but such things are not there. So even like atomic clocks, their nice thing is they are very stable over long term, but short term instability is quite a bit there. Whereas you might find things which are short term quite stable, but long term uh, aren't. So, so anyway, so I can, I can, I can uh, work with these things. Now, if you look at different sources of time that exist, so now I can define uh, I can look at different uh, values of tau and what is uh, what is what is happening over these things. So, like for example, uh, if you look at GPS, so GPS gets it uh, uh, signal from the satellites, which have the atomic clocks. It kind of averages things out and all. So, what's happening out here is that over long term, <coughs> GPS is actually pretty pretty good. Okay, because uh, but over short time intervals, it's actually has a pretty high Allen, de uh, Allen deviation. This one is a standard crystal oscillator, so you kind of see its Allen deviation is uh, this is a log scale, not terribly great, but at very short time scale, it's better than GPS. But by the time you hit like order of a second or a few seconds, then uh, you are, uh, you can have GPS better. So what you could imagine doing is, for example, I can have a crystal oscillator and uh, I can use GPS uh, clock to discipline this guy. Uh, so essentially I can achieve a clock which is which has a long term stability characteristic of GPS but short term stability characteristic of a crystal oscillator. This is NTP which is the protocol used over the internet uh, to maintain time. So you have these NTP servers as like Every major organization would have one, like there's time.ucla.edu, which is UCLA's time server. So essentially, these are computers which have a reference quality clock, usually a GPS, uh, but sometimes atomic clocks. And then they distribute time uh, using a protocol. Uh, so um, if you look at your laptops and whatnot, there would be some configuration. Uh, hmm, what happened? Uh, there would be uh, some uh, 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 configuration which lets you select uh, what server you are using. Uh, sometimes they come built in like Apple devices typically just go to time.apple.com. Microsoft has similar thing. But you can also set them up to refer to a group of these servers. Um, and there are apps on for your phone and all where you can kind of run NTP protocol in user space. So there. A lot of cool stuff that exists, but again, looking at this, you would notice that it's actually pretty bad, even at considerably long time scales, right? I mean, it is, um, uh, it's kind of uh, it's hovering out here, but it drops over very long time. It can actually do pretty, pretty good. I mean, in fact, over very long time, you can even begin to beat uh, things like rubidium clocks, which are like thousand dollar devices and all. But they, there you see that they work very well in hours and days, but then they again have a longer term drift happening. So uh, main thing that I want to convey out here is that um, uh, all these sources of time or really frequency, uh, uh, rate of increase of time, have kind of some, uh, some regime in which they are good at. Um, and uh, um, the name of the game at some level then is to combine these to get a, get something which is good in all the regimes. Um, so anyway, so that kind of shows you uh, some of the things that exist. Yeah, go ahead. So if you're combining two of those clocks you get, how would the deviations then be calculated for that? How would you calculate the Allen deviation for that? No. Yeah, because you said like, I mean, based on your usage, you have to like something Yeah, like, like I was presenting out here, right? I mean, this is a crystal oscillator. 
right? So it seems to work relative to, let, let's say you have, your system has a GPS. And when I'm referring to the GPS out here, I'm not referring to GPS which tells you location. There are GPSs which expose their internal time. So these are GPS hardware which have a pin called one PPS pin, okay? One PPS stands for one pulse per second. So what these GPSs do is they basically send out a pulse on that pin every second. But the every second is as defined by the atomic clocks in the satellite. And the promise they make is that this, this, this um, uh, pulse is within 50 nanoseconds or thereabouts of the UTC time. So now I have a piece of hardware which every second I can go to it and get that pulse and that pulse is within 50 nanoseconds of real time and super and, 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 and uh, uh, can be quite, quite stable. Um, particularly over the long run, okay? So the way I can combine these two things is the following. I can have that GPS refer to it, let's say, once a day, and then correct this guy. So I can apply a correction factor. Uh, uh, so I can learn how much this guy, uh, the crystal, was drifting relative to GPS, learn a compensation factor, and then apply that during the thing. And then the total, uh, the, 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 the the combination that I'm getting would basically kind of intuitively at low, uh, low time scales will have the stability of the crystal and long time scales will have the stability of the GPS. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's kind of the idea. Uh, TCXOs and stuff like that, I mean, they're all kind of residing in these regimes. So long term, your strategy has to be um, to refer to some highly stable reference which corrects you, okay? And uh, GPS is kind of the easiest one you can have access to. It has issues like won't work indoors, for example, um, but, uh, and it's power hungry, so you don't want to, so you can't have a GPS for in which you are relying for every second for that thing because then you'll keep the GPS up and running and then you're burning a watt or so all the time. So, uh, so you, you want to kind of balance that out. So, so uh, uh, back to uh, that figure that I had last time that kind of a typical system internally would look like this. So that if this root is this resonating element, um, clock drivers, hardware counter, or kind of perhaps a hierarchy of them. And then I have the soft application software, but as well as sort of software which is now talking to those references across the network to help discipline this stuff, right? So when I say discipline this stuff, it is either way to set the, correct the hardware counter once in a while, or it will basically learn some sort of a, a function so every time the soft application meets the time, I'll take the reading from the counter, feed it into that model, and then take its output and say, this is actually the time. Okay, so I basically learned calibration parameters. So the resonating, resonating element, there are a whole bunch of options, which I've already referred to. So, but, and some of them I didn't. So the poorest, cheapest, uh, resonating element is basically your standard uh, oscillators that we run up, learn about in kind of circuit 101, uh, uh, LC-RC circuits, right? Um, yeah, I'm sure, or I don't know uh, now where, there are like these timer circuits like five, five, uh, the chip 555, for example, these kind of things, right? What's the problem with these things? So as using it, using them as a resonating element. Highly dependent on the input voltage. Like the resistor is double and okay, so input voltage, sure. What else? Yeah, there's this feedback issue. What do you mean feedback Thermal issue? Run over, I think, or something. Nah. They are big. Passives tend to be big, particularly inductors. Uh, making them on chip can uh, inductors on the chip, but RC you can make on the chip very easily. But what's the problem with making RC on a chip? On a chip? Huh? 
Yeah, so there are uh, so there are two issues. So you're capturing one of them, which is they vary with temperature easily, and the other is very hard to manufacture them precisely. So when you from chip to chip, there will be considerable variance. So when you look at these oscillators, and if you think in terms of that PPM that I had talked about earlier, which was a stability measure, the stability of these things is like hundred thousand parts per million. In other words, pretty bad. Okay. The advantage is that you can put them on a chip, and for places, and they can start the moment power supply is on, right? So they're up and running. Inverter ring. Uh, actually, let's see. Do I have slides for these? Uh, yeah. Okay. I have a slide for inverter ring. Inverter ring is basically an odd number of inverters, and uh, 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 in a in a in a circular loop. So essentially, an edge, a transition here will invert, 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 and then again come back. So it's be basically a runaway circuit, right? Uh, so an odd number of inverters. Uh, again, the issue out here is very similar: that uh, uh, strong temperature dependence, lots of drift that you encounter. But one advantage you you have is that you can have very high frequencies. You can on the chip generate pretty high frequencies because. Propagation delays of an inverter is a picosecond, so you can really can generate very high frequencies very easily. Uh, uh, disadvantage: very low Q factor, or put another way, your clocks are jittering a lot, uh, and the stability again is pretty pretty bad. So, but you you will still find these things because the advantage of these is that again you can have them on the chip, and they are ready very quickly. So. Right after you reset, they are up and available for you to work with. So they are very rapid start, okay? But they are super unstable. But if if you think about it, your CPU only needs the clocks to sequence the instruction. It's not using the clocks to measure time. So if your goal is to simply get the CPU up and running, they do the job <coughs> perfectly fine. The only thing is that the time. Uh, between instructions is going to be highly variable depending upon what the clock is. So if you need stable time, so now we are in the regime of order of 10 ppm, then quartz crystals are your friends. And in recent years, there is another technology which has emerged, it's called MEMS resonators, uh, which is literally, you can think of it like putting a tuning fork on the chip except the tuning fork is made of silicon, okay? So conceptually, sort of think of it that way. They're pretty competitive and uh, quartz crystals, I'm sure you have all seen those, they're kind of in those metal packages and all. So a disadvantage of quartz crystals is they tend to be tall. And as we have been trying to make our phones and such devices thinner and thinner, uh, their volume is not very, uh, not our friend. MEMS resonators, since they can be built on the chip, so uh, if you're making ultra thin devices, great. You're eliminating a package on the printer circuit board. So lots of advantages. And then others, okay. There is also a chip scale atomic clock, which you can buy now. Uh, like I think I referred to earlier for like 1,000 to 1,500 bucks. It's kind of a chip you put on your board, um, uh, but it's power hungry, like uh, 100 milliwatt, 50 milliwatt in that range. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. I think I'm going to skip this. Okay, so uh, so I talked about inverter ring. So quartz crystal uh, is basically a crystal which we cut in a particular angle relative to the crystalline structure, and depending upon the cut you cut direction that you make, it would have a different resonant frequency, and of course, it's harmonics. So when you by these crystals, you will hear terms like it's an AT cut, which is uh, BT cut, and there are a few other cuts like these. They're basically referring to how the crystal is cut relative to the crystalline, uh, crystalline structure, and like I said, that affects the resonance frequency. Now, there's a resonance frequency, and then there are the harmonics. So depending upon what you want, you will use some amplification circuitry to filter things away and pick on the frequency that you want to go with. So like maybe filter everything other than the resonant frequency and then amplify that and that becomes your clock. Uh, some angles in this crystalline structure 
have good immunity to temperature variation. So when temperature changes, the crystal expands or shrinks. It's basically a material. And since it expands or shrink, then the os oscillation frequency changes. So that's the source of that dependence. Advantage is very high Q factor, uh, very uh, high stability, like 1000 uh, with, with uh, 100 ppm very easily, 10 ppm with some modest effort. Uh, disadvantage that you do have to uh, do all this mechanical cutting and stuff like that. Uh, and not all frequencies are possible because the frequency that we are getting really depends upon <coughs> that cut. So we can't just say an arbitrary frequency that we want, you can't just get it natively out of this. You have to play some sort of games to do it. Then uh, you have kind of mini tuning forks, uh, which is essentially when you buy these crystal um, oscillators, which are the 32 kilohertz oscillators, which are used to maintain time on your PCs, they are usually these kind of devices. They can be pretty good, uh, but bulky. All of these things have temperature dependence. So, so, now, so again, there are two sources of problems that we are talking about. One is we can't manufacture in a manner which, uh, is, uh, which doesn't vary from instance to instance. And the other is the variation which is happening over time um, uh, as the temperature changes. So what this is showing is for a tuning fork, how the PPM changes with temperature. And it has a nice uh, structure because it's a mechanical system. You can reason about the thermal coefficients and then how things work. You see something very similar in uh, quartz crystals also. So this is an 80 cut quartz crystal. And if you look at the data sheet, what it will uh, show to you is that how the ppm varies with the temperature and these different cuts correspond to different errors in the uh, in the in the in the cut during manufacturing so like for example the second from bottom curve it corresponds to a zero minute <coughs> error in the angle of the cut and for different angles you have different curves so you'll have these two different sources and in a way if I could figure out where uh, where my crystal is then I know which curve to follow and then I can compensate for the temperature. So TCXOs, the temperature compensated crystal oscillator in effect uh, measure the temperature and then compensate for it uh, but you, one could also do these things entirely in uh, software. These curves are cubic again uh, kind of uh, the underlying physics uh, is kind of dictates that, yeah. TCXOs are also physics or TCXOs, deep inside is just a quartz crystal. It's just that TCXOs are surrounded by additional logic which calibrate these things away. Yeah, so they calibrate the temperature of the ideal thing, so they would have to tag some curve. Yeah, so what they do is they actually do it in the uh, factory. Oh, manufacturing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So it's part of, so, uh, so so what happens is each crystal that is being shipped, each TCXO which is being shipped has to be calibrated before it's shipped out. So as you can imagine, it's a costly process. Like otherwise think about it, why is something which is pennies suddenly becomes tens of dollars? Even though it's just a crystal and some a little microcontroller or some analog circuitry around it, right? So it's not the circuitry, you know, it's the calibration effort which makes it costly to produce. But if you are network connected, you can do this kind of compensation by referring to GPS or referring to uh, some atomic clock across the network also. There are many other cuts that you can similarly uh, uh, find uh, there are crystals which can generate multiple frequencies at the same time. So there are all sort of stuff which kind of exist. MEMS resonators. So MEMS resonators are basically uh, structures which are machined into silicon. So MEMS stands for microelectromechanical system. So they're used for sensors and all the type of stuff. The beauty is that you can build them on the corner mm -hmm. of the same chip as your processor, let's say. Uh, uh, so Again, the advantage, high Q factor, not as good as quartz crystal, but pretty good. Um, but biggest advantage is you can have arbitrary frequency choices. 
because I can size and shape these things arbitrarily. It's almost like I'm designing my own pendulum with the right L and I can get whatever frequency I want. Disadvantage against susceptible to temperature variations and all uh, there. But this thing, arbitrary frequency choices is pretty good. Um, and by putting around it uh, nice circuitry, you can uh, really do uh, compensate for some of their weaknesses. So a uh, couple of companies in recent, let's say, five five years, five time frame, uh, have sort of produced some pretty cool stuff to a degree that now this is like uh, Apple is a big adoptee of the stuff when I'm sure some of Samsung and Huawei and these companies as well because of uh, uh, the desire to have ever thinner thing and moreover re remove the packaging extra packages on the phone. There's a uh, nice little story that I read just a few months ago so this kind of incident happened a year ago around this time last year um, so Apparently, at some hospital, uh, they were uh, repairing the MRI machines, and MRI machines rely on liquid nitrogen or liquid hydrogen or something like that. Yeah, and gas. Uh, okay, some some liquefied gas, <laughs> and there was a leakage for, from that. So that got into the HVAC system and kind of went around the facility. Not fatal to human beings by any means, but all the Apple devices stopped working. And the reason they stopped, and Android devices did, so they kept going. Uh, so Apple had adopted this technology, uh, whereas I guess Android phones kind of uh, were behind in adopting uh, adopting this. And the problem is that imagine now a atom getting into these microstructures, it basically is like dirt clogging your mechanical things. Okay, so quartz crystals are immune to that kind of stuff, but this one, atoms or molecules getting into the structure create uh, create problem. So after a while, they became okay, obviously, when kind of that contamination went away, but uh, it was kind of a interesting, interesting episode. Um, okay, so um, Let's see. What do? Yeah. So now, uh, if we look at uh, kind of re recall again, kind of that oscillator driving the counter, and now if we look in terms of if I'm examining that uh, <coughs> the software visible notion of time, right? I mean, I'm basically I'm seeing a counter which is incrementing at some rate. And if I were to analyze that uh, thing relative to uh, that reading relative to some reference, then at very small intervals, my big source of error is a quantization because my counter can only increment with a certain granularity. So uh, my ability to measure things finer than the frequency I have is obviously going to be not there. So, what if, if, if we were to look at the uh, error that I'm seeing at very small time scales, I'm going to be quantization limited. At any very long time scale, I'm going to be temperature limited because temperature is going to start corrupting things. Even TCXO and all are impacted by temperature. It's just in a more in a in a in a more delayed manner. So uh, short term, if you want, uh, then you have to have low quantization error, which is another way of saying that I need high frequency and a high, and so that I can drive the counter with a better resolution. But at long time scale, I need to do something about this temperature, uh, either by design having an oscillator which is more immune, or having some protocol which consults a reference to. Let me uh, let me let me do stuff. Um, let me ask you a question. So we hear about processors running at gigahertz clocks, right? <coughs> and yet I'm talking to you about these oscillators and all 
you can't buy a quartz crystal oscillator for a gigahertz. I mean, they're all few megahertz type things, right? Um, how do I go, how do I change frequency? So, uh, if I give you a signal of one frequency and I demand from you a signal of a different frequency, a phase, lock loop. phase lock loop, right? So, everyone familiar with phase lock loops, right? So, we basically <coughs> design a control loop around my native clock to multiply the frequency and that uh, it's a pretty tricky circuit design and but uh, you can uh, I mean uh, you can generate multiples and divisors very easily. There is also a lot of cool work in recent years by actually Professor Sudhakar Pamarthi out here where you can do um, rational ratios uh, kind of nicely. Uh, so, there is a lot of circuitry which sits around these oscillators to let you actually generate the frequency that you want. Okay, so, so that is uh, I can, so frequency division uh, by powers of 2 is easy, that is just feeding into a uh, flip flop. Frequency multiplication and uh, so that is the phase lock loop, so for those of you who do not know, uh, kind of the basic idea is that. I have the reference oscillator. This is my good crystal, but it's low frequency. And then I feed it into, uh, so this is my kind of control loop. But basically the bottom line is that I have a voltage controlled oscillator whose input I'm going to control so that I get the desired multiplier frequency with the desired multiplier. And then I'm going to divide by N. So frequency divider is easy. And then I'm going to do a phase error detection and then smooth it out and control the things. So essentially, by having a control loop, I can multiply the frequencies. And to get this VCO, we just use the inverter ring uh, uh, for this purpose. So while inverter ring is pretty unstable normally, but here it is sitting in a control loop, so I don't have to worry about that. Okay, so uh, so, that was uh, what is happening kind of on the low level hardware. More interesting for um, kind of from what is happening at the, what is visible to the software really is what happens up the stack. So, at some point through our circuitry and PLLs and what not, I have a clock signal, kind of a nice good digital signal and then it is incrementing some hardware counter and now sort of what, what happens after that. So, if you look at different um, microcontrollers, for example, they would have kind of a large part of their data sheet would be devoted to how the clocking system is working. So, what are the different sources of clocks and then how sort of you generate internal clocks and all. Some clocks we need because they are dictated by the standards. Like, for example, if this thing speaks USB, then the USB standard mandates a particular clock frequency. So those things have to be generated, but the rest, um, or, or likewise for radios or GPS, there are very specific frequencies that are required. But the rest of the stuff is really all up to us to fill. <coughs> so this one is showing uh, a particular microcontroller. And so what you see out here is there is a main oscillator. And what typically these things do is they let you con connect the crystal and then the oscillator circuitry is actually provided on chip. So you don't have to deal with that. So you just put the crystal outside, you can directly connect that. But the problem with this stuff is that if you power it up, it can take tens of millisecond for this thing to reach a uh, op operational frequency. So they are kind of often slow to start. So what you will also find on these chips typically is an uh, internal RC oscillator. So kind of the idea is that if I'm designing a processor which should wake up very rapidly, do something quick and go back to sleep. Uh, if you recall early on I had talked about like little processors, big processors and how the little processor uh, excel at like <coughs> doing little uh, kind of waking up, doing something quick and going back to sleep. If my clock were to take uh, many milliseconds to just wake up, then that whole strategy falls apart. Fortunately though, when all your microcontroller is doing is wake up, quickly do something, go back to sleep, I don't need the precise clocks, uh, clock frequency at that time. All I need is something which just runs the instruction. So internal RC, RC oscillators do a great job at it because they are very rapid to start. So 
that's the role out here and uh, and typically what happens is if you are if you are going to uh, run for a long time then you will start with this internal RC oscillator and then at some point you are going to switch over to the main oscillator when it is stable so if and, and if all you are doing is quick and dirty get up do something go back to sleep then you can just operate on the RC oscillator Finally, uh, we also need to maintain time when uh, we are asleep, okay? Like, I mean, it would be quite problematic if the system goes to sleep and when it wakes up, it has no notion of time, right? So that's the job of what is called as the RTC or real-time clock oscillator. And these things are basically designed to maintain time to like some fraction of a second okay but over long duration that's it that's the RTC clock on your PC motherboards also so you uh, there would be a separate sort of uh, uh, port for it and this is where uh, uh, the clock source being used are typically those tuning often those tuning fork types because they are very low frequency okay uh, which you can't generate off the quartz crystal so this part usually uh, the RTC stuff and the corresponding counter is usually uh, part of a separate voltage domains. What I mean by that is the power supply for this thing is also separate. So the idea is I can cut off power to the rest of the system and only this little corner keeps up and running. The, this clock keeps running and then by spending maybe microwatts or perhaps even lower, your system can maintain time. <coughs> rest of the stuff then has these PLL, so you see a USB PLL in this case, and a main PLL, uh, and then sort of clock dividers of various form. The main point is that through this hierarchy of PLLs and multiplexer, I can generate different kind of clocks. I can change the clock of the CPU, to, so to do our like dynamic frequency scaling kind of stuff, for example. Uh, I also feed those clocks to different timers and stuff like that, so uh, yeah, so peripheral clocks it goes out here. So a pretty complicated clocking system that uh, that, uh, that 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 would uh, exist in these things. Something analogous happens in big processors also. And one other thing to keep in mind is that uh, distributing clocks consume a lot of power. So in big processors, maybe a healthy 30, 40, 50 percent of the power may actually just go to getting the clocks around because these are signals which are always moving around and so they're switching the capacitances all the time so clocks can be pretty power hungry uh, here these are smaller chips so have less of an issue so to summarize then i have three different oscillators main oscillator which is a few megahertz uh, internal one which is internal rc clock which is not very stable but pretty fast and then finally, the RTC clock, uh, which is a separate power domain, which is meant to keep long term, uh, long term time. Any can be chosen to drive the main CPU. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, there are, uh, like I said, there are provisions in there so that after that you may start with the RC oscillator and then switch to the main oscillator. So an interrupt would occur. Uh, indicating that hey, it's time that you can safely switch to the main clock, for example. Uh, RTC can wake up your system, but only with coarse granularity. So, like for example, in this case, the resolution is one second, but it's usually kind of a fraction of a second. Okay, but you can't specify, let's say, down to microsecond or nanosecond. It would be kind of like tens of millisecond uh, at best. But you can arrange for things so like usually what you can do is if you expect an event to be coming at some time in future you can use the RTC to wake up just prior to that and take into account kind of all this um, granularity issues that you have so Yeah, just a sec. Okay, so uh, so what you are seeing out here is the following. Um, uh, usually in these chips, you would have some sort of a reset signal. So you reset and you apply, typically the, the specs would say, you have to apply the power before you get out of the reset. 
and the reason for that is because your power supply takes time to kind of gradually reach a healthy state. So your voltage is rising and then becomes at some point stable. Uh, so the reset is reset pin is held low until that point in time. And meanwhile, as this voltage is rising, at some point the internal RC oscillator will become stable. And so at this point, you can switch over and IRC is stable. You can continue with that. And then at some point, similarly, uh, you would say, okay, now my quartz crystal is stable and I can switch to it. But the main thing you notice out here is from the point I started applying power. So the power took 60, voltage took 60 microsecond to stabilize. And then after that, within a small number of microseconds, mm -hmm. I'm up and running with the IRC. So essentially, let's say, less than 100 microsecond, um, good to go. Whereas your quartz crystal oscillator can take a few milliseconds. So big, big win, big win to be had. Let's see, I think, uh, yeah, this is just showing the RTC. Um, to maintain uh, time, at the application level. So if you are working in uh, high level programming languages on top of an operating system, then all the hardware details are hidden from you and all you get is from the operating system, some calls to get to deal with time, like what time is it, wake me up and some time and all. But deep down, really there are a whole bunch of special uh, timer devices that are available and um, uh, if for embedded operating systems, usually you would have APIs and all to kind of deal with it. So there are some pretty cool capabilities that exist in these things. So uh, just to sort of walk you through again in this microcontrollers and you'll find some similar stuff there. So there are four general purpose timers, external event counters available in this thing. So again, normally you just get to see a notion of time, but now here there are four, so you can use them for a variety of purposes. You can also count events using it. So like you can either use them as timers or you can use them to read external, like count incoming signals. So you can use them as sensor as well. Uh, you can uh, program the clocks you are feeding to the different timers. Then there are two capture channels per timer. And the idea behind the capture channels is that I may have, let's say I have a signal coming from the outside and I want to timestamp it very precisely. I want to timestamp uh, the value uh, of the clock at the time the signal edge went from zero to one. So normally you might do in software, you tie it to the interrupt and then the so interrupt handler, you go and read the timer. But what <coughs> these capture channels let you do is at the hardware level, you can specify that when the signal comes, then take a snapshot of my clock, my counter which was running. So basically to a single clock period accuracy, you are going to be able to timestamp uh, uh, time the signal. So it takes a snapshot and, uh, and then once it takes a snapshot, it can generate an interrupt. So for very precise timing of external signals, that's the way to go. So for example, earlier on I had mentioned that GPS has this one PPS signal, and I can use that to co correct error in my clocks. So a very common strategy is that you feed the one PPS signal into a capture channel. So every time the PPS signal comes, I'm getting a snapshot of my timer. And now I can use that to uh, compensate, basically. I can see how much my clock is drifting because I know GPS is stable and uh, work on that. Let's see. Uh, then there are these things called match uh, registers. And the idea out here is that um, uh, I can specify a value in this match register. And whenever my counter, which is advancing with the clock, matches that value, some sort of an interrupt gets generated. So I can generate arbitrary type of signals using that very precisely. Again, software gets out of the way. Uh, Okay, so the rest you can read. So uh, the thing I guess I want to point out is that usually these capabilities are not visible to us on top of the high level languages and all. Okay, we, we get a very abstracted view of 
the actual hardware's capability, but uh, uh, if you dig a <coughs> one level deeper, you find a whole bunch of stuff. There are a whole bunch of specialized timers also. So pulse width signals, which I talked about earlier in the course that how we can use them to represent analog values. So usually there are special hardware support for that also. There are also special hardware support for uh, various operating system functions um, uh, that kind of exist. There is something called washdoc timer, which is a very valuable thing. And the idea here is that it's a timer, <coughs> which if it, it counts down and if it reaches zero, then the chip will be reset. And the idea is that if the software is working correctly, then the software is expected to reset this timer before it reaches zero. So uh, this is to detect hung software, for example. Uh, yeah, okay, so these are, these are some of the capabilities that uh, kind of exist. And again, uh, most microcontroller units will have, um, micro, microcontrollers will have a pretty rich uh, ensemble, of, uh, ensemble of these things that are available and exploiting them is very key to kind of creating efficient, robust type of systems. Okay, so so what we have now uh, at this stage is kind of at the hardware level and kind of the very low level of the operating system, what I have is a uh, counter, which hopefully is good uh, and it's free running, it's advancing, so I can consult it and it can basically tell me what local time it is. And usually it's basically telling you local time since we powered up. It has absolutely no notion of what UTC is, right? So because it, the counter starts from, let's say zero at power up and then it's kind of running. So the next level up, how do we synchronize multiple devices or how do we get to know, how, how do we give our device a notion of what the global time is, falls onto time synchronization. So that's what we are going to talk about. Um, next. So when we talk about synchronization, it has kind of multiple, uh, uh, multiple definitions, uh, sorry, multiple interpretations that different people use uh, and sometimes wrongly so. So sometimes people call time synchronization when they actually mean frequency synchronization. So I have two clocks and I want to make sure that the frequencies are the same, right? Uh, when do you think we might need that? What can think of some application where I don't care about the time being the same, but frequencies being the same. Why? But then that is not time synchronization. It's not frequency. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, data transfer, right? So. Remember when we had talked about serial transfer, we were sampling on both sides and we wanted to make sure that the sampling rate was the same. So that's an example of frequency synchronization. So actually in communication courses, oftentimes they call it clock synchronization, which is kind of a term which can refer to time or frequency, but really what's going on there is they actually are aligning clock frequency uh, as opposed to clock time, okay? Uh, when you synchronize frequency, there's a very special term for it called syntonization. So syntonization is synchronization of frequency. Uh, now, if all I'm doing is uh, aligning frequency, uh, I may have a difference in phase still. So actually in communication, what you really need is uh, also phase synchronization going in there. And then finally, there's time synchronization, right? Where I that word that the syntonization, syntonization. That also refer to phase. It refers only to frequency. <coughs> it only refers to frequency. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so be careful. A lot of what we are talking about and interested in is really time synchronization. Okay. But to do good time synchronization, you need to have phase and frequency synchronization as well. 
because otherwise you will be just continually synchronizing the time. Okay, so so the hardest problem really is time synchronization because the other two are prerequisites for that. Okay, clock skew. Clock skew for our purposes is the difference in the time values of two clocks. So two count. Remember, kind of two systems that have these counters. And if at any point in time I look at both of them, and let's say they are right next to me, so I can look at both of them, whatever is the error is what we are going to call as the clock skew. Synchronization basically then refers to two clocks are set to be synchronized if at a particular instant of time the skew between them is less than some delta. Or in other plain English, if I were to look at the two clocks, uh, the time that they are reporting is within delta of each other. A uh, set of clocks we say are synchronized if any two clocks within them are less than delta apart. So clock synchronization would require, I mean assuming, so I mean you could imagine an ideal world where we had clocks with perfect frequencies and I were able to start them at the same time. But there are no such, that's, that's rarely the case, you firstly don't have perfect drift free clocks and then the ability to start two things simultaneously is not not easily uh, done. Uh, uh, remember in an earlier slide I had this picture of voltage rising before the processor can start. So even if I were to reset things simultaneously, you may still have some errors creeping creep in. Around. So it's just generally very hard to have like uh, uh, let's say if our phones didn't have didn't speak NTP or other synchronization protocols, imagine how can you start them together, okay? It's just incredibly hard. So clock synchronization generally therefore does depend upon a concept of transferring time. That is, one node should be able to convey information about what time it has to the other node. So each node can, in effect, read another node's clock value. Uh, and when we read over a network of some form or IO link of some form, there are going to be communication delays and which are unpredictable. So that's what I was referring to the earlier example when I say what time, like we're trying to synchronize watch orally, there are unpredictable delays in that process. Some other things we want. We don't want time to ever run backward, right? So let's say, for example, I ask you what time it is in the clock and it's, let's say my watch is ahead. If I were to turn back my watch, all sort of funny stuff can happen. So what kind of things you can do you think can happen if I were to turn back the clock in a computer? Yeah, but what bad things can happen from that? <coughs> Okay, operation can repeat, great. What else? Y2K. Huh? Y2K. Nah, it's not Y2K. You could, I guess, if you had like a, an order of a se sequence of events, you can lose track of what, what occurred in what order if you yeah. had sampling. Well, I mean, I may also lose correct sequencing of events in a database, for example. I may have security issues, right? I mean, we all, I'm sure at some point in our life have tried to turn back the clock on our computers just to extend the license, right? Uh, now, of, so, but the thing is, even tiny bits of time moving back is uh, can can have consequences which you may not realize. Okay, but you're right. Y2K had a similar set of things, and I guess the GPS rollover, which took place earlier this week is an example of that as well. But I think by now humanity is pretty good uh, at this stuff. I think Unix time will saturate in the year 1937, I believe, or something like that, right? Uh, yeah, so, so there are other time bombs kicking. But this one is more serious, right? I mean, it's basically saying if I'm not careful and I'm synchronizing clock with another computer, then if my clock can go backwards, then my local software can get immensely confused, right? It may even appear that, I don't know, if I'm, let's say I'm measuring speed of something. I time stamped it, and before I did the next time stamp, the clock moved backward. I may have some kind of faster than speed of light or something like that kind of phenomenon kicking in, right? So you have to be very careful. Uh, 
so the trick out uh, so um, so the trick in these things is that you slow down the advance of time instead of correcting the time fully you kind of slow it down and then you meet the correct trajectory so those kind of things one has to do okay so why is time synchronization important uh, there are lots and lots of examples and actually interestingly synchronization has a long history in physics uh, if you google for einsteinian synchronization there is kind of uh, a lot of experiments thought experiments and all that einstein did re relating to relativity all had to do with observers of clocks and what were happening to them and all so there's kind of a rich rich history and uh, now with gps availability you can actually uh, for yourself actually see some of those effects there are cool things on the web where people have two gps's synchronized they take one up on top of <coughs> Mount Mintney or Everest or whatnot, and after some time bring it down and you see that one of them has slowed down. So the relativi <coughs> relativistic effects are actually observable even with commonly available equipment nowadays. Uh, here, so uh, first thing is that uh, uh, I can, uh, if, if I have properly synchronized things, then I can talk about whether events, uh, the ordering of the events, right? So. I can uh, remember I talked about the logical clocks earlier. If I have well synchronized clocks, then essentially I also have a good logical clock, right? If I nodes were precisely aligned and the clocks were precisely aligned in time, then I can always unambiguously talk about events and their ordering uh, there. So uh, event, I can talk about whether two events are at the same time and stuff like that or not. Uh, so I can, uh, other things I can do, I can coordinate actuation, uh, two, two actions have to be done and like for example, maybe like, I don't know, like some weapon where it has to fire simultaneously from two places, those kind of things could accomplish with, uh, be accomplished with precision. Data logging, uh, um, uh, what's the absolute time of occurrence? This is often very important, right? I mean, um, a lot of security things and all are based around it. Measure of performance, uh, when things go wrong in a computer or a network, right? I mean, uh, how much time did the packet take through the net, uh, through a switch? Uh, did this event on this computer happen before or after this other one? Because that can help me analyze uh, causality, like which one caused what, okay? All those kind of things depend upon the ability to synchronize time and also obviously measure time. Um, in signal processing, time has always played a very crucial role. Uh, for example, there is this whole broad set of algorithms with go under the umbrella of beam forming of various form. Like for example, some sound event is happening and I have a bunch of microphones and I want to detect which direction it is coming from. So a very common uh, notion is that the time wave with a sound waveform will hit the different microphones at, uh, at the, the, the relative time of arrival is going to let me compute which direction the sound is coming from. Uh, so some of you uh, I think uh, are doing course projects which are around, around this thing. Same thing works at RF also. The so-called um, MIMO radios and all kind of rely on that. Uh, localizing things, tracking things, uh, all of these things depend upon, uh, implicitly depend upon synchronization, uh, synchronization of time uh, in particular. Um, uh, I, uh, you also have these things at a even higher level. If I'm tracking a missile or tracking a vehicle or an animal, so now I have sensors at different points in time, they're giving me a reading and I'm going to take those readings and I'm going to fit a trajectory to them. And to be able to do that effectively, again, we would require all those sensors to be synchronized in time. If, if your synchronization is off, then that in these cases translates into an error in the application level. So this is an example where error in your clock translates into an error in um, uh, whatever application level computation you are doing. So what this plot is showing is uh, that using that sound arrival thing, if my time sync has error, as that increases, the error in the beam forming, which is computing the direction, correspondingly sort of changes almost basically proportionally. 
So, uh, so in many, uh, so these are all examples of applications where you could relate ability to measure time to ability to some application metric performance. There's a lot of other work which has happened in recent years showing like for example, let's say you have a control system and the sensors are time stamping the readings, but if that time stamp reading is off a little bit, then the control loop will go unstable. Okay, so there are the research on kind of talking about uh, those relationships, how can you sort of design to be ro uh, not uh, designed to be robust to that. Uh, Sandeep, my student who is going to lecture on Monday in his research, one of the things he has been exploring is, let us say I have a machine learning model and which I have trained on multiple sensor data streams. Let us say I am training a model to detect something, some human activity which involves two different sensors. And I train them assuming that they were perfectly aligned in time, but then at test time the alignment changes. So then the uh, performance of my machine learning algorithm will change. So those are kind of push areas where again <coughs> synchronization helps tremendously. Okay, I think, um, yeah, I'm going to skip that. Uh, another place where synchronization plays a big, big role, time synchronization is at the so-called medium access control layer of protocols of networks. Mm -hmm. So anyone knows what medium access control stands for? Like what does it do? From your networking courses? Channel access. Channel access, Channel access yeah. Hunting when people are trying to use, then how do you distribute like a lower? Right, so medium access control, medium refers to the channel, some shared channel. Access control is saying, I have multiple users who want to use it, how do I coordinate among them, right? So one way which Aloha that he referred to is basically saying, you know, I'm not going to coordinate. We are just going to transmit and then see if we succeeded and if not, we are going to retry, right? So we will, uh, so the issue out here is if two people transmit at the same time, then their packets collide, then they don't make it through, right? So, so that's one way. But the other way is we can say, you know, we all have synchronized clocks. Let's coordinate. I'm going to transmit on the second. You are going to transmit 0.1 second after the second and so on and so forth. So we can pre-schedule some, some way of transmission, okay? But that requires us to know the time. So to be able to do that kind of coordination, I need to have all the nodes, their clocks should be synchronized. But not just that, their clocks need to be synchronized very accurately because if they are not, then I have to deal with the possibility that I may be too early or too late. So like for example, let's say, let's say we agreed that I'm going to send you a packet at whatever, 7 p.m. But, and we decided that long in advance, our clocks are a little bit off, so uh, could be off. So if by the time it's 7 p.m., if our clock can be misaligned by a second, then you will have to entertain the possibility that I may actually be transmitting a second before 7 p.m. according to your clock or a second after 7 p.m., right, or anywhere in between. So that requires that we then activate our radios taking into account that error and that is referred to as the guard band. So, so what is happening now is that any error in our clocks is translating into this dead time with where I am I'm having to be extra cautious and uh, that results in not only additional latency but power being burned and also we are occupying the channel needlessly, right? Even though my packet needed only some time but I need to budget some extra time around that. So the capacity of my network because imagine there are a whole bunch of other users. If each user needs this guard band, then I'm lowering the capacity of my channel. So synchronization accuracy in this case directly translates into power <coughs> as well as oh, whatever, wasted energy as well as uh, uh, wasted channel capacity. So, uh, so actually uh, I referred to earlier chip scale atomic clocks. So the whole chip scale atomic clock work was uh, driven by, uh, as usual, many of these technologies from by the U.S. Department of Defense because they wanted the radios that soldiers carry to be super efficient 
and also the fact that the spectrum is precious, uh, lots of devices, so they wanted not to have any wasted channel capacity. So, what is a good way for us to have very good synchronization capability? We'll have chip scale atomic clocks. So, that is what kind of drove that work, but this is this is this is really at the heart of it. Um, to kind of dive a little bit further into like how this plays out in networks. So, imagine I am designing a system which is going to observe some phenomenon, let us say a car going by or I have a deer out here. Okay, So, like I am designing a sensor overlooking a uh, road and the cars go by and I want to make sure I detect every car. Okay, And cars go by rarely. Okay, So, it is once in a blue moon type event. Okay, it's not it is not that I can just keep the system up and running all the time, but rather whenever there is an intruder or that vehicle going by, I want to capture that. So, if you think about it in a system like that, there are several different uh, things at play. So, firstly, I want to make sure, uh, so I and, I and I also want to make sure that my system is power efficient. So, instead of keeping my sensor on all the time, I am going to duty cycle my sensor. I am going to put it to sleep, activate it, take a me take measurements, go back to sleep. Okay. So, every time we wake up, we are going to make measurements and usually you are going to collect a few samples just to have some better ability to infer. So, multiple samples and then if there is nothing, I will go back to sleep. Right. So, we collect a bunch of sensor measurements, feed it to some estimation algorithm and get is there a car there or not. Now, I am going to be duty cycling, uh, I am going to do it, uh, duty cycling my sensor, so every so often I am going to wake up. And what I have to make sure out here is I wake up often enough so that even if a car is going by with at the maximum speed, I do not miss it. That is, uh, every time a car goes by, uh, whatever time it takes, I should wake up at least once during that time. So, if a car is going to be in my field of view for 5 seconds, then that means I cannot sleep for more than 5 seconds minus uh, whatever time it takes for me to make an inference. So, my duty cycling in part is limited by the dynamics of the car, the dynamics <coughs> of the world, right? That if the world is very rapidly changing, then I need, I cannot sleep much. But then there is another part of the story, which is once in a while, my sensors are going to report an event. They said, aha, there is a car out there. And now I need to send that event out uh, over the network so that the control center can act upon it, for example. So this is where one of the challenges that comes up and people who did a lot of earlier work on wireless uh, networks for these kind of systems kind of realized is the following. If I look at a wireless link, so pair of radios, transmitter, receiver. Um, so what happens, what, what, what happens is that I have some information being generated which gets encoded and whatnot and then we feed it into a RF <coughs> amplifier. So the radio waveform goes over the wireless channel decays with distance, is received at the receiver, um, goes through amplifiers and stuff like that to recover the signal, demodulation, decoding and whatnot. Now, if you stare at this, there are kind of very broadly three sources of power consumption. One is power is consumed by these digital electronics. This is where your MAC protocol, your encoding, your uh, modulation, all of that is taking place and likewise is counterpart of the receiver. And the other, uh, so the two electronics, and then you have the power amplifier. Power amplifier is boosting the RF carrier and the modulated signal on it so that it is received with adequate signal to noise ratio at the receiver. So, power amplifier, uh, as you might imagine, if I'm sending the signal over long distances, has to transmit at a high power. Okay, and the other hand, if I'm just transmitting within this room, let's say, <coughs> then it could be pretty low, right? So like Bluetooth radios, for example, are like a milliwatt transmit power or even lower. On the other hand, cellular radios can be order of watts and like TV transmitters and cellular base stations and all can be, huh? 
even like yeah hundreds of watts or kilowatts right depending upon how how far apart they are transmitting okay so what does it have to do with what i'm trying to say out here so one component uh, rx1 which is this green one depends on the distance the other two <coughs> transmit and receive depend upon the algorithms we are doing right um, so if I'm a cellular phone transmitting to a far away, uh, to a base station a mile or two away, I would expect RF to be pretty high and quite possibly dominate the other two. And indeed, that's what happens. On the other hand, if I am transmitting over a short range, room scale or sub-building scale, then RF can be pretty low and the electronics will dominate. Which electronic do you think will be more dominant and why? Okay, my figure shows receive is more dominating, but why do you think receive is more dominating? Remember, these these are the things which are doing your kind of protocols and algorithms, right? I mean, so why why do you think receiver might be more energy hungry, more power hungry? Uh, why yeah but why why is it more pro wh what does the receiver have to do conceptually noise in, noise in the signal it actually has to hunt for the signal it has they solve complicated optimization problems right from a noisy signal it has to extract the thing so the algorithms that the receivers do are far more complicated than the algorithms that the transmitter does so usually your receiver is going to be a lot more complicated like coding is always easier than decoding right decoder has a harder job long story short out here what this means is that if i am in a short range communication scenario then transmit electronics is plus the rf can actually be lower than the receiver uh, receive energy right so for the same duration so conventional wisdom in wireless always was transmit is expensive right when you take standard communication courses when they talk about uh, energy and all they're really talking about this energy the rf component eb over n naught that you hear in communication courses and all they're all about signal reaching the other side in terms with adequate snr and all but if i'm de if i'm in the short range realm uh, let's say less than 100 meter uh, then rf is pretty low and actually, transmit electronics can also be pretty small relative to receive. So you often have these situations where receiver, uh, it, it, to keep the receiver up for a certain period of time is more costly, even if it's not receiving anything, it's just up, listening, <laughs> can be far more expensive than transmitting something. So the standard mindset where I can keep the receiver up and listening, and then the transmitter is what I'm optimizing, doesn't make sense for a lot of IoT situations, okay? Because we are in this short range kind of realm. So back out here, so now the situation I have is that I am, uh, I have this mesh network of IoT devices and uh, my device, once in a blue moon, generates an event, it's a rare event. But I can't expect rest of the mesh network to be always vigilant listening for that rare event because as I made the case that listening is expensive, okay? So I actually want the radio to be asleep uh, as well. So that leads to kind of a different way of uh, thinking about how you orchestrate, how, how you run the, uh, how, how you coordinate these radios. And as you will see shortly, time plays a important role in this process, which is kind of a long build up to this. So how could we uh, deal with deal with this issue? So what's happening now is the following. So let's say I have these devices and they are duty cycling. They'll wake up, listen, is there anything on the channel? Go back to sleep, listen, go back to sleep. And let's say for our purposes right now, they have good frequency. So they can wake up with, with a good periodicity, but they don't have shared knowledge of time. So B and A are following their own very separate schedule, right? They are 
both waking up with some period, that's <laughs> the same period, but they are not aligned. And then A, at some point, had that real event. So, uh, by the way, this is talking about the radio. But uh, A, at some point, noticed an event that what, uh, so now it wants to send a packet. Except B and A are not time aligned. So I have to find some way of uh, sending the packet out. Um, so one way you could imagine doing this is the following. When A has the rare event, and A has no knowledge of when B is waking up or going to sleep, right? Uh, A doesn't know the phase, right? So what strategy do you think I can do? I can follow out here. So let's say it's like I'm calling you and I know it will you are asleep, but that every one minute you wake up and check the phone or something <coughs> like that, check the message. So how long would I ring the phone for? <laughs> one minute more than a little bit more than a minute right because then i'll know during that time you'll wake up at least once so that's the basic concept out here but we kind of build around that so the essential idea then is that for each packet i can make the preamble which is kind of like the ringing the preamble is what the receivers latch onto to decode the packet to know that there is a packet so preamble is a special specially coded bits which are sent out so i'll just make that preamble very long so this is what happens out here I will, A will, when it sends out the packet, instead of the preamble being just sufficient for A to synchronize its clock frequency, now I'm going to make the preamble as long as the period. So that we know that somewhere during this preamble, A will wake up, sorry, B will wake up, and then the packet payload can go through. Of course, if I'm unlucky, I started sending this long preamble, and uh, B woke up right at the beginning, then I'm basically B is wasting a lot of energy and I'm wasting a lot of energy, right? Um, but hopefully, if the events are rare enough, then maybe I don't care too much about it. Um, uh, so I, I, could, I could do that, yeah. This assumes the knowledge of polling time of B. It, it, it assumes that there is a universal polling time, yes. It indeed does, and so, Strategy becomes more complicated if uh, polling time itself slightly varies uh, because, again, as we discussed earlier, even frequency may not be perfectly aligned. Okay, uh, so but there are ways to kind of deal with that also. Like for example, maybe both parties have <coughs> GPS and they can periodically correct the frequency. Okay, so uh, so the strategy is a step forward, but not still not quite there. So the better strategy is what I can do is A can send a same packet many times. And the idea is that one of those packets B will receive successfully. And the moment B receives a complete packet, it can stop receiving further. In fact, you could go even more uh, advanced. After every packet I send, I can wait for an acknowledgement. And if I get an acknowledgement, then I can stop sending further packets. So what B will do in that case is once it receives a packet, it will send out uh, acknowledgement and then I don't have to send rest of the thing. So <coughs> this approach um, uh, can work nicely and there is a lot of work around this. What it requires is frequencies be synchronized. Okay, so it needs synchronization, uh, but it doesn't need alignment of time because we are discovering at the as things happen. So this is one approach. But the other approach is what if we had knowledge of time? What if uh, things were synchronized time wise also? So then our system will look like the following. A and B wake up together. And so all A has to do is when the packet happens, it will just wait until the next event. So this is like a schedule. We are basically saying a and B uh, both know that they can exchange a message at a particular time, but now we need to maintain the time. So usually in these systems, then what happens is there is a periodic time sync. Periodically, one of the parties or maybe some master will send out like a beacon saying, this is the time. And then everyone kind of sets the clock and then they can so Wi-Fi, for example, works along those lines. So the access points uh, send out 
essentially an information saying that uh, this is a beacon, uh, essentially that's like a bell ringing. Everyone listens to it and sets their watches, okay? Um, the, uh, the access point can send it out very frequently because it may be that you may miss some of them because you were asleep at the time of the bell. Uh, but they are done with sufficient frequency that you can keep setting the time and you have some reasonable clock on you. So typically in these kind of systems, time has be synced every 10, 15, half a minute, something like that. Um, and then what you also do is that when you are actually exchanging the messages, you also have to account for that there may be some error, like I think we are waking up at the same time, but not exactly. So there's going to be some guard band that you are going to also budget for. So if you have time sync, you can play these kind of games. You can uh, schedule communication uh, there. So actually, yes, these systems, including Wi-Fi, are far more advanced. So what happens is instead of, of course, everyone waking up every so often, they actually, as part of the beacon, they also advertise a schedule. So like, for example, let's say your laptop was asleep. And meanwhile, there are packets coming for it to the access point. So what the access point does is, as part of the beacon, and so your laptop will wake up during the beacon time because it knows that the beacon is coming then, they will also send a traffic map. So in that traffic map, it's basically a big map, which says, is there a packet is there some packet waiting for my laptop? And my laptop will see that in the traffic map, it says that there is something waiting for it. So then it will just wake up at, at a designated time within, within that time frame and actually receive the packet. So, uh, so there's a more complicated structure on top of this where you negotiate things, specific time slots where you are going to actually receive the packet. This is how, for example, also traffic, which is very synchronous, like, for example, Wi-Fi gives special treatment to things like voice traffic and also packets which are carrying voice because they need to go through with minimum latency and have some guaranteed uh, traffic. So again, kind of building upon this structure, you can do all those, all those things. So asynchronous, synchronous, kind of two very broad ways of communicating, but fundamentally, we are dealing about kind of time. And again, as you can imagine, if magically all systems, all nodes in my network had knowledge of time and for free, then communication would be very simple. I can, uh, I can, uh, uh, in fact, if we had very precise knowledge of time, like if our clocks were totally, totally aligned, then think about what will happen to my communication packets. So communication packets have a preamble. Why do we have the preamble? So, so it can track. What, what, what purpose does the preamble serve, right? So every time before my payload, so when I send a payload, there's a header, IP header and stuff like that. But even before that, there is this bit pattern that we send, which is what I was showing as kind of that long preamble, right? So what's the purpose uh, when we send that preamble? Right. So basically what's happening is it's serving two purposes. Number one, that there's a transmission coming, it's kind of on the lookout for the tone. And the other thing is it sets its clock frequency, right? But if we had great clocks, I wouldn't need a preamble. I can just start squirting out the bits and the other party can listen to it. So or another way if we had good clocks, I can shorten the preamble or eliminate the preamble. So part of the reason behind those chip scale atomic clocks also was to get rid of the preamble. Now, why would I want to get rid of the preamble? Because preambles can be very costly. It's one thing if you're sending a big IP packet with 1500 bytes or jumbo packet with even more bytes. It's entirely another thing if I'm sending you a event report, which is, let's say, a few bytes, okay? And how long are my preambles? The preambles could be tens of bytes, okay? So just to carry a small, few bytes, I have to send this long preamble. So anything I can do to get rid of that preamble is going to again enhance the battery life. So a lot of effort in uh, wireless stuff for IoT embedded devices has really focused on how to optimize these aspects of a radio, okay? Radio should be able to wake up very easily, go back to sleep very efficiently, should have small preambles, 
and should have a knowledge of time okay so that they can do this kind of scheduled communication easily okay so uh, yeah um, bad clocks cause guard bands and therefore bad clock in turn uh, limit the duty cycling we can do so duty cycling refers to um, that I can go to sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up. So the ratio refers to a duty cycle ratio. And any error in my clock basically means that I need to have a guard band. So the guard band is directly related to uh, <coughs> the skew that exists, the delta between the time. And so the higher is this, the higher would be the guard band. And that would basically place a limit on uh, how how of how much I can sleep basically so the duty cycle ratio so anything you can uh, so so if you can have good time with zero power then I can be very aggressive about saving going to sleep basically so that's that's kind of the moral of the story out there so okay so communication is so sensing, communication, and a whole bunch of things, all these kind of questions. When did an event take place? Where did the event take place? Where am I? Uh, all these protocols and other coordinated actuation, all of these things fundamentally depend upon time. And the accuracy with which you need to know time can go anywhere from seconds to nanoseconds, right? Seconds and are like security systems and stuff like that. But there are uh, easily uh, in micro milliseconds and microseconds we encounter very easily in kind of a lot of routine applications but also um, like microseconds and nanoseconds when you're trying to measure distances for example within a room and all so those kind of things okay so so when we think about um, so, so all of this has to be achieved by these time sync protocols so um, uh, when we kind of one way of thinking about then is what kind of requirements we have. So what's the error we allow? For how long do we need to synchronize for? Uh, over what area do we need to synchronize? How much power budget and all I have? If a lot of power available, if all my devices are plugged in and I'm kind of have view of the sky, I can just use GPS. So, so there's no one magical answer that you can give, you really have to kind of tailor it to uh, specific applications that you are after. So, to think about like now, so, so, so now we have this thing that I have, I have a bunch of devices, they have local clocks of varying quality and I now need to, I want to give them a shared notion of time as appropriate. So first source of error obviously is the local clock, which we discussed a plenty before. But very important for us is that the clock have frequency issues. <coughs> so even if at right now we were synchronized, a little bit later we will no longer be synchronized. So I have to kind of do something about this also. Then the other is issue is synchronization rate. Um, uh, if we were to exchange Message if you were to resynchronize very frequently, it would be a lot of network traffic and a lot of power consumption. So that would not be good. Um, it's kind of like if I were to repeatedly ask you what time it is, what time it is, just to synchronize my clock, it would be annoying, right? Um, time of flight. So, uh, if to transfer time, so like to transfer time from one node to another. If my communication medium is very slow, then that's going to occupy the channel more. It's going to be more costly. Um, so, for example, if I have two things talking over radio, then speed of light very quick. But if I have two nodes under ocean, then radios won't work. We are probably using acoustics, <coughs> speed of sound, a lot slower. So, that will have implications. Computational latencies. So, if you have an application running on top of the OS, by the time uh, arriving packet over your network or radio reaches this code, it goes through a lot of delays in the operating system, and those delays can be highly unpredictable. So, that can cause issues. 
and then timestamping. Remember, I referred uh, so 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 for example, let's let's do the following thing. Let's say I have a very precise clock, and I want all of you to set your clock to mine, right? So this is what we, we are going to do. I'm going to send out a beacon. And let's say we agree, I'm going to send that beacon out every every second according to my clock. And when you get that packet, and, and let's say at the beginning we decided t equal to zero, so we have agreed upon that. Now every time you get the packet, you will see that how off is your clock from mine, and then you're going to adjust your clock. Now let's think about what kind of errors which are going, what, what, what things you need to do out there. When I, when my, uh, I have to make sure that the packet going out from me is not facing inordinate delay from the point I set, send the packet to the point the packet is actually going out. <coughs> and likewise at your end, when the packet comes to your antenna, you have to make sure that by the time it reaches your code, that delay is also uh, manageable. Because if it is not, then you will be set, setting the clocks incorrectly. Part of that will involve some stage timestamping the packet. When the packet is coming in, you have to timestamp it. What time it is according to your clock so that you can correct for it. So if this timestamping is not good, then also you have you'll have a problem. So all these things kind of add up to complicating life uh, when it when it comes to um, uh, transferring time. So the state of the art when it comes to uh, synchronizing. So one, as I mentioned several times today, is GPS. So GPS internally, since it has to compute X, Y, Z, and T, uh, so location and time, so if it can spit that time out, then you can benefit from it because that time it is calculating is very precise because it's really trying to, in effect, synchronize with the atomic clocks. So many GPS boards send out this PPS signal and this is a signal which comes every second, as the name implies, once per one pulse per second, and its accuracy is to a few tens of nanosecond. Okay, so uh, relative to the global time base UTC basically. But it's power hungry, outdoor only. If you put your GPS to sleep, it can take tens of seconds, minutes to reacquire the satellite, so it's not just available quickly on demand. NTP, several milliseconds of synchronization error, tens of milliseconds, and it takes time to convert. So like if you do a cold start, it's not as if it will immediately get the time. It will take some time to kind of convert because internet has lots of variation and delay variations. We're going to see that next week uh, when I go more in depth. IEEE 1588, this is a newer protocol. Uh, it aims for, on a local area basis, less than a microsecond, better than a microsecond accuracy. And this is being used for like factory automation or things like that. Uh, actually, yeah, a lot of places which you would be surprised that are heavy users of uh, uh, these kind of precise protocols. Financial industry, which I think I mentioned uh, earlier. Disneyland, every ride throughout the park is synchronized, okay? But, uh, so, uh, uh, movie industry, a lot of places where you might not imagine, but the degree to which sort of time sync plays an important role. Uh, this thing actually uses special time stamping hardware in order to get down to this and actually some places like CERN, which is the physics lab in Switzerland, uh, have very highly tuned version of this thing to get to sub picosecond because they are trying to observe atomic phenomenon and uh, particles across their 26 mile or whatever radius uh, accelerator. So very precise timing uh, there. And then a variety of protocols and all, I've just picked one example, it's not a standard. Uh, on how to achieve good uh, uh, synchronization over wireless devices which are nearby. And even, I mean, this is a pretty old work uh, out of um, Vanderbilt. Uh, but today with some modest effort, you can get to 
let's say 0.1 microsecond synchronization between a collection of wireless devices within a building relatively easily. Um, with a lot more effort and with chip scale atomic clocks and all, maybe you can get down to single digit nanoseconds. Uh, so a lot can be done. So I'm going to stop out here because um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a new topic. So, um, uh, but we are going to go through some of some of the, some of these things. Okay. So, so again, those of you who came in late, I sent out a homework assignment today is due next Friday. Uh, also, Monday's lecture is by my student Sandeep, who's going to talk about reinforcement learning and kind of some of the more modern stuff happening there. Huh? Monday is a holiday? Yeah. Seriously? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sandeep doesn't know. I didn't know. I thought I was. Okay. So, well. Are you guys? Why is Monday holiday? Okay. Well, in that case, see you guys on Wednesday.